Let's begin with prayer. <clears throat> Our loving Father, what a blessing it is that you are the God of the universe. You have allowed life to continue and you've given each soul in here an opportunity to be with you forever. You are a loving God, a wonderful God, a caring God, a providing God, and also a just God and a wrathful God. Help us to remember your kindness and severity. Thank you for giving us your word. Please bless us as we're here together this morning, reading from it. May we understand your words. May we discover your message for us that is in these words. May we be convicted by them and may we be encouraged and leave here better equipped as your servants than when we walked in. Thank you for each soul here. We know there's chaos in the world right now. You have allowed this virus to exist and infect people and people facing times of uncertainty apparently, but we are thankful that you certainly care for us and we can put our trust in you. Bless those who are still coming here this morning. And we do ask for rulers. Not only would they themselves find you and submit to you and become your servants, but may they also make laws that will go with your law. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Okay. So we are in this little chronological study of the Gospels. We are in Luke 4. We're picking up in a text. We, we had basically left off at verse 37 last week. We read further, but we... We basically made points from verse up to verse 37. So we begin in Luke chapter 4, verse 38. Jesus is displaying more power here. Verse 38, then he got up and left the synagogue and entered Simon's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him to help her. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And she immediately got up and waited on them. While the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. Demons also were coming out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God! But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak, because they knew him to be the Christ. Fever, diseases, demons, you know, you see trucks drive down the road, they got these signs on them, you know, we do it all. Fevers, diseases, demons, spiritual, natural, <clears throat> Jesus does it all. So the question is, <clears throat> he would ask us, what, what can he do for us? Or maybe better phrased, what do we want him to do for us? Because he can do it. Now he can do it physically, he can, he can do that. But he's concerned about spiritually, really. He wants us to be more like Jesus was. And he says, look, if you want to be more like I am, you can be with my help. So may that be our goal. I have a couple points to make from this little text right here. If you have a comment or a question, please raise your hand. I'm impressed with the word in verse 39. Standing over her, he rebuked the fever. What a scene this presents to your mind. That word rebuke is the same word that's used in a bunch of different places. One of them would be when Peter says, no, you shouldn't go to the cross. He rebukes Peter and says, get thee behind me. This is the same word. So, so Jesus can rebuke humans, and we're used to that. No, stop, bad, wrong. Jesus rebukes spirits, evil spirits. In fact, it's used in verse 41, rebuking them. He would not allow them to speak. It's also the word used when Jesus is in the sea and calms it. He rebukes 
the wind and the sea. I don't know about you, but I'm impressed by that. But here's the point. This one who called the elements into being can make them go away like that. And I don't know if you know this yet, but your body comprises some of those elements. And so, our Savior is a loving Savior, but He's also a King that has great power. And so, fear Him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, it, and when you read a text like this and you say, look what He can do. He can, he, bam, it's gone. <laughs> He, that's the kind of power he has. And in his love, he mercifully lets us continue. But he could, if he wanted to, make us all go away just like that. I find it interesting. Simon's mother-in-law was suffering. Simon was married. What was her name? Mrs. Simon. What else do we know about Mrs. Simon? Very little, but enough. What was Peter later on in the church? An elder. What does that say? Actually, hold on. We'll get there in a second. 1 Corinthians... Chapter 9, Paul will write, he's defending his apostleship is what he's doing to some unreasonable people. But 1 Corinthians 9, 3, my defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? The answer is yes. Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles do, and the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas. There's Peter again right there. So what do we understand from this text? Peter, when he would go around, apparently was taking his wife. Even if he wasn't, many do. But you don't know that. You never read. And, and there's Mrs. Simon working there. But she is. She's supporting him all along. There are many silent partners, I call them. They go here, they go there. Oh, the preacher stands up and everybody knows the preacher because he's always talking and he's in front of everybody and he's doing all that work and that's wonderful and that's good. Yes, that's great. But right behind him or right beside him or sometimes right in front of him is this woman who contributes so much to the work. So we, we were thankful to Mrs. Simon for the work that she did many years ago. And then, as we indicated a minute ago, 1 Peter 5 says that he's an elder. That means, what kind of a woman is she if he's an elder? I have seen, and you have too, men who could be elders but for their wives. The, 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 it's just, whatever the situation is, she's out of control, whatever. And there are men who should never be elders that are elders. So right now we're talking about women. Mrs. Simon apparently was one of those women who was a good woman. And so we're thankful for We don't read anything about her, but we learn about her by implication. Comments or questions? I don't want to do all the talking. That is a necessary inference. Right, right. Yeah. He, he rebukes this thing like a demon. Go on. I, 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 that is all I've got. It's just, it, you know, he, it's, it's not a... I guess I wouldn't know where to tell you the term, but when I, when I think of these sorts of healings, I think of like that there is a, uh, you know, you pray for their healing, you know, that kind of thing. And, and this is a rebuke as though this is an entity that needed to leave her body. Right. It's an interesting perspective about illness. Yes. I'm not, I, I really am not drawing any conclusions. Yep. It may be more about his authority than the impact of the illness on her, but yes. The, the significance in the word, there is significance, Gary. And, and one thing about it, you can see that she is a godly woman is that she is made well, but she knows first thing. First thing. How can I serve? Right. As opposed to many who, now we're talking about the mother-in-law, many who upon being healed would, remember, nine out of ten didn't turn around to say thank you. Right? She, she gets up and 
she says thank you, as it were. I find it interesting, in verse 41, the demons also were coming out shouting, you are the son of God. Now, we talked about this last week, and, and you don't want the, uh, some people you're not going to align yourself with, even though they say he is the Christ. He's the Christ. Did the demons say he's the Christ? Did they believe he's the Christ? Oh, they absolutely did. But he says, no, I'm, there's this. There, there's, there's a disconnect here, and I don't need that testimony. John 5, when he says, look, if you don't believe me, believe all these things, he does not say believe the demons. Although, he could have believed the demons. Anyway, we talked about that last week. Shouting, you are the Son of God, but rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak. Do you think they went on and spoke? No. He would not allow them to speak. Now, 2 John 9, let's go ahead and turn there, 2 John 9. You can turn to other passages that make the same point. 2 John 9, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Okay, so the first part of that, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. What does this imply about the teaching? It can be known. And sometimes I illustrate it this way. Or this is, I'm not a great illustrator, but there's a circle of teaching. It's not... It's not a circle like this where, you know, just, you know, whatever. You can say this over here. You can say that over there. You know, just as long as you just say you love Jesus. That's, that's it. You, Jesus, is, that's not it. No, there's a, there's a sphere of teaching, and you can step over and go too far. Now, of course, no human ever does, right? <clears throat> Wrong. Because he goes right on the next two verses and talks about in, in, in Second John. In John. Right. He goes right on. That's what he's talking about. Look, if somebody comes and they're not in this circle, don't, don't, don't share it. They're... Right. <clears throat> don't give them the hand of greeting, so on and so forth. People do it all the time, which is sad because the laws of nature obey God. Inanimate things that cannot think obey God. Demons, when he says, go into the swine, where do they go? Into the swine. They obey God. Humans are the ones that go too far, right? Colossians 3, 16, is it? <clears throat> says, about verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, so if you, if you obey, if you do it, if it's an action, a behavior, if it's your words, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's a sphere that he has permitted us to do, to say, to think. You better not go beyond it. In Timothy, Paul will say over and over and over, point out these things to the brethren. 1 Timothy 4.11, prescribe and teach these things. So on and so forth. Verse 15, takes pain with these things things. Verse 16, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. And you're teaching there. Here, men just, so I have to be very careful that I'm not. And we have to be aware that people do. They go too far. Comments or questions here? So, I do have a question for you. I don't know if y'all are aware of this, but there's a big virus going around right now. <laughs> Um, so could Jesus make that virus go away? Yeah, and let's not. Okay, so so I got an email or text message that says this. Now you'll have probably have had a similar discussion with somebody, or you've read it on Facebook or whatever it is you read. This is the this is what was said. Now John Bosworth just mentioned something about necessary inferences. The idea behind a necessary inference is something that can, that's forced from a statement, okay? So somebody wrote this to me. It's God's 
plan. He has watched us for too long and knows we all need help. Can you guys read that? Sorry. Okay, so he and I are talking about coronavirus and how our house is not going to sell it. <laughs> and oh, God can make it sell if he wants to. <clears throat> and he wrote to me, it's God's plan. Coronavirus is God, what's happening, the virus is God's plan. He, God, has watched us for too long and knows we all need help. Now, there is something that we can know from this statement of his and something that he's kind of guessing at. Okay. Do we know that God actively, I'm going to assume that he, it's God's plan. Now, there's, there's God's permissive plan. He allows it to happen. I get, yes, obviously, he's allowing it to happen. Did God send coronavirus? You can't know that. You can't know that, right? This seems to imply he, this man thinks he does know it. It's God's plan. How do, how, why? What, what, why do I say he thinks it's directly God's plan? Because this man goes on to say, he's watched us for too long and knows we all need help. And so there's some direct connection. So it seems to be that this man is saying, <clears throat> God directly did this. Even if I'm wrong about that, we can't know God, he did it directly. We can't know. We know he's permitting it. We can't know. What can we know about this man? And you've seen similar statements on the internet and everywhere else on the radio. What do we know about this man? He believes there is a God. Say it again. He believes there's sin. He believes there's a lot wrong. You go down the road right now, everybody believes there's a lot wrong. By the way, who do they think there's a lot wrong with? Everybody else. <laughs> right? You look, 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 we've got to change. Okay, here's the book, chapter, and verse. Here's the Bible. Here's God's word for you. Are you ready to change? Oh, no. No, everybody else has to change. Okay? So be, be aware to look for that. I don't want to overstate it. I don't want to state it too confidently. But be aware that now is a time where people understand, yeah, the world has been a mess for uh, six, eight thousand years. Right? And people are just... You know, so people see it. So this is an this is a, a conversation starter, or it sounds like the conversation already has been started, and you can take it and say, "Yeah, you're right. There is a lot wrong with the world." Now, can you can I change George as much as I'd like to? No. Can George change me? No, he cannot. Who can I change? Me. And you can change you. And that and that's the point we got to make to these people one at a time. And there is a judgment. It's coming. And God's going to be looking at you and say, what did you do based on your reaction to this conversation and others like it? Um, a point of where it's about where speculation takes us. So I had a lot of conversations like this over the weekend. Yeah. Um, and about COVID? Uh, about, oh yeah, about COVID-19 and about why it was here. Yeah. Okay. And there were two, two trains of thought, generally two groups. And one was Satan introduced it. Um, through the Chinese worshiping cats and eating them, okay, which they don't know. And the other one was God introduced it. God introduced it as is obvious enough because um, the bowling alleys and the theaters and other places of sin are having to close. <laughs> and, uh, all right, um, not my idea. Okay, so so anyway, both equally speculation. Yeah. And one of the ways it's easy you, you can identify speculation through a better means. But when two people look at the same situation come with totally different understandings of why it's there, at least one of them is speculating. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but speculation can go anywhere, including opposite directions from the same situation. Right. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Of course, Christians never speculate. Right. 
Okay, we're human, we're prone to it, and we've got to be careful what we're saying about these kinds of things, and we've got to be saying, uh, you know, and, and this is just, you know, COVID come, will come, and COVID will go. But speculation will stay, <laughs> won't it? It's, that's what, so we need to be careful to go back to these words. Is this what they really mean? Okay. Anybody else? Anything else? Be really quickly also about this particular sentence here. You notice that there is a desire to find a pattern more present in this person's mind than, there's, um, uh, than there is a desire to just have faith and you can't identify the pattern. Because he, he says something justifiably true. Yep, yeah, it's good. Right? He does. And, and so he can, if he knows the Bible, he can look at his life and see that when they kept on sinning, he would introduce a plague in them or whatever. So he sees a pattern and he says, maybe the pattern is now. And, and that's good on one hand, but on the other hand, the better thing is that, you know, we can't possibly know, so instead, faith. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm done with this little section right here. Verse 42. So we move on a little bit. When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were searching for him. Remember, this that's a, a main point. Last week we said, a main point of this section is his popularity is exploding. He's getting to be huge. Everybody's loving him, uh, kind of, right? But he knows what's in them. And so we talked about all that last week. You can go on YouTube and visit those uh, notes if you want. When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were searching for him and came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. couple points from this. The great thing about Jesus is that you can share it. Isn't that wonderful? So here's the question. Are you? Right? Yeah. But I, Lee made a great point, didn't he? Lee made a great point. You can share Jesus. Oh, man, we, that makes us feel good because, we, you know, I don't have to keep Jesus to myself. We can share him. And I want Jesus, and I want you to have him. Okay, great point, Lee. Now, here's, the, here's where the rubber hits the road. So what are you doing? What am I doing? Am I, am I going out and saying, hey, here's the Savior. COVID-19, it's chaos, but our Savior is the King. He's got it under control, and someday we're going to be with him. So let's talk about the Bible and faith and loving him. Okay? We can share him, so are we? even in these situations. Number two, someone is always trying to keep Jesus from fulfilling his purpose in their life. But that's what, it, he said, no, they, they wanted to keep him. That would not be fulfilling his purpose. He says, I got a purpose to fulfill. And I would suggest that when we are not conforming to the image of Christ, we are not allowing his purpose to rule in our life. Yes, he wants to save us. Amen. And we're grateful. We're saved by his grace. And then he says, now change. Because <laughs> you're not good enough. Your behavior is not what it ought to be. Passages that come to mind. Colossians 2. <clears throat> Paul talks about philosophy. That's his main argument, the first part of his main argument. Watch out for philosophy. Why? Because because Jesus is enough. That's all you need. You don't need to go to Cornell. You don't need to go to Yale. You don't need to go to Oxford or wherever you're going and have the benefit of a good education. All you need are these words. Colossians 2, 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of man, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Why, Paul? Why? For in him <clears throat> all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Remember that Savior who just spoke and the, the fever went away. He spoke and these diseases went away. He spoke and the demons left. He spoke and the sea was calm. That one. That's all you need. Life's problems. Oh, what do I need? Him. Verse 10. And in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all. Rule and authority. And in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism. 
in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God. Remember, baptism is about accepting God's grace. Who, who has been baptized and says, I, I, now I'm ready for the kingdom because of what I did? Nobody. The one who truly submits to God's baptism is one who, yes, I'm a sinner and I have done wrong. Remember this point. I'm a sinner. I'm a, I do wrong. And I accept God's grace. I put faith that in, in meeting him in baptism, he will save me. He raised us up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, so on and so forth. Now, he saved you. Great. But you're still ugly. Verse 20. If you have died with Christ, reference to baptism, to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? By the way, are they religious people? You bet you. Yeah. Keep your finger here. Turn to 2 Timothy. Second Timothy, verse 5. Just read that verse. Holding to a form of God. Uh, chapter 3. <laughs> Whoops. 2 Timothy 3, verse 5. You can read the context later. Holding to a form of godliness. Are they religious? Yes. But listen. Although they have denied its power. This is what we're talking about. Some people do not allow Jesus to fulfill his purpose in your life. Yes, he saved you. But then you don't let him work on you. I don't let him work on me. Verse 20 of Colossians 2. If you've died with Christ, why do you keep on doing these, and I will paraphrase, religious things that God doesn't ask for? 2 Timothy 3 says it's not helping you. In fact, it's denying his power. Because people think, I'm, I'm religious. I'm, look, what, look at all I do. I'm, I'm very religious. And in one way you are very religious. But being very religious does not necessarily accomplish his work in you. Chapter 3, Colossians 3, one. If you've been raised up with Christ, have you been baptized? Listen. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things that are here on the earth. If you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in baptism and then afterward, when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed. So on as we could go on reading this. Look. Your baptism is so important. And then because you were baptized, allow Jesus to work in your life. Allow him to change you. Why do you keep on looking at the garbage on the television? Why do you keep on looking at the smut on the internet? Or reading the book? Or paying too much attention to the road sign? Or whatever the case might be. Instead of positively turning your eyes to these words, assembling, and other works that will help us. Comments or questions? I need improvement myself. Jesus does not allow, I'll make this last point. He said to them in verse 43, so back in Luke 4, 43, Jesus said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities. I was sent for this purpose. And like natural law, he then goes on to fulfill his purpose. That's it. I was sent for this purpose? Hmm, big surprise. We see him doing what his purpose was. Verse 44, so he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. I need to be more like that. I, I cannot allow anything to distract me from fulfilling my purpose. Now, I often do allow things to distract me. And I'm thankful to God who's full of grace. All right. Jesus goes to Judea. Now, I have the map gone because is Jesus going down to Judah proper or is he actually staying in the same area that is often called Judah or Judea at that time? Probably the latter. I have no idea. It doesn't make that much of a difference to me that I know of. <clears throat> Verse 1 of chapter 5. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him, 
and listening to the word. Remember the, the theme of this section is crowds, 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 and listening. He was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the lake. Uh, can you guys see that? Can you see it on the on the map? Yeah, and then and then there's uh, right here is the the village of Gennesaret, uh, right below that. So sometimes the sea is named. It. Okay, so it's the Sea of Galilee essentially. He saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. I know this story, this account, is about the Savior. It's about Jesus. I'm going to make it for a minute about the disciples. First point is this. Here you have the account of Jesus calling the disciples. We've seen a previous account of Jesus calling the disciples. John 2 was about, uh, John 1 was about Jesus calling the disciples. So John 1 is going to happen over here, but you notice there's a lot of time there. There's a year, and here we are somewhere here. I don't know where. I'll say there. He's calling them again. If you look in Acts chapter 2, the point is apparently they were not with him all the time in the very beginning. That would not be unreasonable. Acts 2, when Peter says, we need to get a new apostle, and they get Matthias, he will say, verse 21, Act, excuse me, Acts 1, 21. It is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all, all the time, that Jesus, listen, went in and out to or among us, so here are the twelve and the disciples, many disciples, and Jesus would go in and out of them, right? So this might be one of those periods that, yeah, he was with them in John 2, yep, and he was doing work with them the, 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 at Samaria and other places, and even at the wedding in Cana or Galilee, so on and so forth, and then there's a period of he's not there or something, and then he calls them again here. I, I don't know exactly what's going on. Is welcome to my life. <laughs> okay. But this is about the disciples. I'm about to make it into the disciples. Peter, in verses 1 and 2, is living his life. Does anybody in here have life? Okay. You know we're looking in the mirror. All right. He's living his life. I might add the word faithfully. How do I know from this text what indication do I have that he's faithfully living his life? Actually, the absence of it would be an indication of not living your life faithfully. You know that he was faithful from other passages. And I know from this passage, what was he doing? Huh? He was what? Working. Is it important for a Christian to work? Right? Huh? I'm uh, second. Yeah, so let's start, you know, 2 Thessalonians, right? That, that's, that's what uh, George just mentioned. I'm going to mention it too. You know, there are, you know, COVID-19 is going to do some funny things, right? And, and so there are times, there are times of funniness. Um, but generally speaking, what should characterize a Christian? 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. We, such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus to work in a quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. There's another passage that says, whatever you do, do your work, uh, you know, somewhat, just, you know, just is, get by with the bare minimum. Just show up. And when the boss comes, make sure you look like you're doing something. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men. So Peter, this is one indication. Look, Peter is a, a this is, a, Gary said, we understand from other passages, Peter's faithful. I, I get that. Here's another glimpse, a glimpse into this person's life. Verse 3. He got into 
one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. So this is part of life. Peter is called upon by Jesus to act for God, right? This is a specific act, but people, this is what we're called upon. And Peter learns from Jesus. This is like us opening up our... Verse 4. Peter receives an unconventional challenge from Jesus. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put in to the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, right? So they've already been fishing. It's time to pack it up and go home and get some breakfast and take a little rest or whatever the case might be. And Jesus says, no, put it over there. G Peter's response, but we, we've been, we've already been doing it. It implies, look, there's, Jesus is testing him. It's a command, but it's also a test. If you do what I tell you to, you're going to love it. Verse 5, Peter tests Jesus. Verse 5, Simon Peter answered and said, Master, we have worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. There are no greater words than these right here. I will do what you say, whatever it is. Literally, it is upon your word. I like the phrasing there. It's, it's as though he's suddenly been activated. Peter, Peter was going this direction, but suddenly something changed him, forced him to go another direction. What was that? Jesus' word. I will do as you say and let down the nets. And right here, this is, this is Peter testing Jesus. We've already done this. This is a perfect test. We've already tried it. It didn't work. Now let's see what you can do. By the way, the difference between doing something from faith and doing something without faith. Same exact thing. One is in faith at the command of Jesus. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that he fell down at Jesus' feet, go, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish, fish which they had taken. So also, And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. So Peter is overwhelmingly pleased with Jesus as, as Jesus passes his test. Right? That's what's happening. Something else. Peter humbly confesses his faults and failures and confesses, to the, and confesses the Lord. Verse 8, he fell down at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Notice he said, Lord. Did Peter understand? I may even be pushing this a little too far because often you would call anybody in this situation master or Lord. I've got to be careful not to push it too far. But Peter understands who Jesus is is claiming to be. Verse 10, the middle of it, and Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, so he's forgiven. And then Peter is commissioned, from now on you will be catching men. And then Peter uh, what, what's going on? sacrifices everything and lives perfectly lives the rest of his life for Jesus, right? Let's read. When they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. A couple points from this. This is everybody's life. Step one, you're living. And then you have an experience with Jesus. Now, I don't mean to be some subjective experience. These are the words, and they convict you. And you realize, I am a sinner. It says so right here. I have done these things. And Jesus will save me. And I love him for his grace and his mercy. And you are moved by that. To confess your sins and confess him as the Lord. And then you're forgiven. And then you're commissioned. And then you sacrifice everything and follow him. That's Romans chapter 12. Your life should be a sacrifice. Now, I said perfectly lives the rest of his life for Jesus. Who in here has read about Peter in the Gospels? Right. John's laughing. Because Peter, you know, he, again, we're looking in the mirror. We see Peter and say, that's Lee. Here's the point. 
did Peter really understand anything he was saying right there? Not really. Not He understood some, yes, but he's going to learn a whole lot more. Such little faith, yet forgiven. Such little knowledge, yet forgiven. So many mistakes to come and to be repented of and asked forgiveness for, yet forgiven. So here's the point. Again, we see this and we say, does God is the ideal perfect behavior? It is. That is the ideal. But when you don't get there, don't despair. Confess. Feel godly sorrow. I am sorry, God, that I hurt you. I am sorry that I hurt whoever. I am sorry. Please forgive me. And I know you will because of your word. I find this interesting also. Peter, who we know is going to be bumbling around with his words, doesn't know much, doesn't have much faith, is yet qualified to be a messenger, a servant. So, have you? did you live perfectly this week? No, he confesses. I do too. Everybody in here probably does. But yet we're still, if we're knowledgeable and faithful and forgiven and humble, we're qualified to say, hey, I'm not perfect, but here's the one who is. Let's be more like him. There's a lot of perseverance and redirection. Yes. And they have to go together. And if you just persevere and do the wrong thing, <laughs> you get further and further away out. Right. But the, you see Peter redirecting yeah. every time that more of that knowledge comes got a better understanding of what needs to be done. Stubbornness, is it a good thing? Can, can be. You need it. Trained properly. Um, show me your faith without your words and I'll show you my faith. Would, would we claim that Peter had faith here if he hadn't done the work of obedience? You know what I mean? Like if he hadn't? If he had not. Right, of right. Of course not. Right. Of course not. So, you know, I, I have faith that Jesus can accomplish these things, and, you know, uh, it's not a words. It's not a words. Right. Great. Okay, Peter, sit there. Yet, I believe you can do it. And then don't be obedient. And right. Would, would any of this actually happen in, in that instance? No, he would not have hauled in a lot of fish that Christ miraculously supplied him if he hadn't done the work. And that's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of work there. Um, and we can identify the faith because of and, and to go a little further, what an insult it would have been. Mm. What an insult. Oh, I believe you can. Like Ahab was the one in Isaiah 7. Oh, I'm not going to test the Lord. What an insult. Oh, I want to make this point. This is we've kind of been dancing around this point. I've said this point. I want to make it again. When Simon Peter says, "Go away, I'm a sinful man," Jesus turns around and says to him, "Do not fear." Isaiah, Isaiah six. Here I am, send me. Comes after the fear Isaiah had felt. And then the Lord touches his lips and cleanses him. Now, in both of those situations, do you think that the rest of their lives, they always think they always got it every single time? Not at all. They're human. They were forgiven. And they need to maintain that forgiveness by his grace. They need to come to him and say, Lord, I messed up again. Jesus will say about Peter, after you have returned. Okay, so he falls away. Even after he's forgiven, he falls away, and God, Jesus says, you'll return, and he does return. But my point is this. Here are these people. They are forgiven. And what, what a blessing it would have been intellectually at that very point to say, wow. But you would not have changed your feeling other than adding joy. And that you would say, no, no, I really am a sinner. No, you, you don't understand, is what we often say. He does understand. And so the, this feeling, <clears throat> my point is, be careful of feelings. Be very careful. The, Jesus said, do not fear. What was he doing? Fearing. <laughs> right? Jesus says to him, do not fear. 
So be careful of feelings. Are not, God's word is the authority. God's word is the standard. We compare our life to his word, not our feelings. Having said that, his word provokes feelings in us. But they can be, we can, we can end up with the wrong feelings if we're not careful. Okay, uh, if you don't have anything to add to that, I will go on to this last little part right here and say this. Verse 12, while he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when Jesus, when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he ordered him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest to make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Side point real quick, Jesus did not come to destroy the law. Here's one of those passages. No, no, I'm pointing to the law. Go obey the law. But, verse 15, the news about him was spreading even further, and the large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. My last point is Jesus can keep on doing this all day long. He, 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 I can do it again. I, you want to see it? I can do it again. I can heal somebody again. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. And I can change you if you'll just allow me to work in your life. Verse 16. Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. And there's an example for us. So, I mean, what, what we do with our downtime. Yeah. Is, is a huge thing I get from that. Yep. And, and the need for downtime. Is equally huge, but then what we do with it. That's not right. Yeah, and, and these have invaded that. They've I mean anything can, anything can, but these so easily and so pervasively invade the downtime. Uh, you know, who here likes to people watch? I do. Who here does it anymore? Not unless I intentionally put that thing down. No, I'm not taking it out of my pocket this time. I was at Lowe's yesterday. You know, it had been at least 45 minutes since I checked my email. And so, I, I was, oh, am I? So, I'm, I'm there, and, and all of a sudden, I'm waiting in line. There's, a, there's somebody there. I'm staring at candy. I don't want to stare at candy. There's not much productive in staring at candy, although you want some. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I feel my hand going into my own pocket. And what's it going to do? It's going to take, and you've got to stop it. You've got to, no, no, I'm going to look around. I might miss an opportunity to see or to say or whatever the case might be. I'm all done. Thank you for your work. Anybody else? Comment or question? I just like how he says, I am willing, and tying into God describing himself, I am, yeah. in, in you know, the beginning of the Genesis, um, and ties in with what you said about him. He can be whatever we need. Right. Sometimes he knows better than we do, though. <laughs> Always. Yeah, but yes, very good. Okay, thank you for your work. Let's break till right on the hour or whenever the light switcher switches the light.